the title, I'm not going to review. When you go invited me to give a talk, he said, you know, I said, I don't even have a title. What am I going to talk about? Everybody is doing bench work. I just actually retired as Professor Emeritus. I'm still involved, but, but no more bench work. Uh, the lab has been downsized. What were we going to do? He said, you know, just use the title from 10 years ago. So I used the title from 10 years ago, but I changed the 50 to 60. But that's not to say that uh, I have nothing to say. So uh, first, thank you, Hugo, for organizing such a wonderful uh, meeting. And, uh, you know, I retired October 1. Uh, I got flowers. I also got a cert from the department and I got a certain glass cup saying, thank you for many years of service. That's from, uh, I don't know, some department at the University of Washington. But there was no party, no lunch, no cake. It was COVID. So I thought maybe today will be, in a way, not saying hello, uh, goodbye. I meet all of you and I continue to work with you and interact with you. But actually, um, everybody that spoke today I've known for many years. And so that's the beauty of it. And that's why it was a smaller group. And there are people that were not invited to the party, not because I didn't want them to be here, but Hugo also had a fixed time, how much time we have. So, and those that didn't answer, if I waited for too long, they were crossed out of the list. So first of all, thank you all for being here with me. And, uh, the skeletal muscle satellite cell still young and fascinating at 60. That's exactly what you have all shown. Uh, there is a lot to go on and, 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 and it's still young and fascinating. And I thought I'll use this opportunity today to tell you a little bit about my own journey and how did I end up with satellite cells. Uh, I like history. When students ask me, what are you going to ask us in our exam, you know, if there is some exam during the, the career, I said, you know, you know your stuff, but I like history. So be prepared to some questions about, you know, Heflick's value, uh, who discovered the microscope, you know, things like that. I'm not going to go that, that deep, but about myself, how did I end up with myogenesis? And, um, you know, I did uh, the first year, uh, it was 1972, 1973 in the Weizmann Institute as a graduate student. I did three rotations. I didn't like anything that I did. I did very well. I got recognition from the dean, but I didn't like it. It was about tRNA. It was about viruses. I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. And a good colleague of mine asked me, think back, what did you like in the undergraduate? You did a lot of projects, you were a good, stu good student. What of all those projects really made you tick? And I thought about it that in my last year of undergraduate, I um, worked with uh, um, a person at the biochemistry department and we did a lot of cell culture and we did a lot of enzyme kinetics and it was differentiation of hepatoma cells. So he said, that I think was my best project. So he said, go and talk to David Yaffe. So I went to talk to David Yaffe and you know, David Yaffe, he passed away. That's the bottom article that we published in, uh, in European Journal of Translational Myology just a few months ago. And that was with a great help from many <laughs> colleagues and from Hugo. And David Yaffe looked at me <laughs> and said, come back in a week. No, no, capito, rispondere. During that week, he, you know. uh, he uh, called probably places in Jerusalem. He was not one to take students that right away. And finally, I was approved. So those years were very fantastic years, potentially the best years of my life in research because I didn't need to think about grants. I didn't need to think about anything. I just was very creative and the group was amazing. And this was the dawn of molecular biology. I'm not that old, but the dawn of molecular biology wasn't that long ago. So the peak of molecular biology was to try to isolate RNA, 
and look at the profile of the RNA and discover genes by doing RNA translation. And I actually discovered I chain, um, in, in RNA in a self-free system. And, and the rest is history. If you like to read more, look at the recent article, uh, Farewell to Professor David Yaffe, a pillar of myogenesis, was published in 2020. There are, I wrote there a little bit more about my, my experience there and my wonderful time as a uh, graduate student there. And then David Yaffe used to tell me that a good developmental biologist must study invertebrate, um, invertebrate uh, development. And as I followed my husband to Canada and later to Seattle, I actually picked uh, first Artemia, uh, which I have here on the top right, the pro it's, it's uh, gastrulation, quiescent, active gastrulation, being uh, maybe Gabriella knows that uh, they are collected a lot at the <laughs> great salt, uh, Solteran, they are in California and in Utah. They are food in aquarium, but actually their biology is super interesting because uh, they have a lot to offer at the gastrula level, active and inactive. And later on, I uh, joined a sea urchin lab here. And again, uh, lots of uh, combination of uh, uh, protein synthesis and uh, molecular biology. But after around end of 81, beginning of 82, I felt that I cannot take it anymore, that I need to go back to myogenesis or stay home with my young son that was just young kid. And I tell you, if not for my husband's support, I probably would have done it, but he insisted that I go and look for a muscle bio lab where I liked it so much in earlier years. And this is how I ended up uh, in 1982, uh, discovered Mark Nemerov, uh, he passed away a few years ago, had some money for, for uh, a second postdoc, I started working with him, and that was again a fantastic experience. I was left to myself to do a lot of things as long as it was with the bigger picture. And when his project that he wished to do did not go well, I said, let me do what I, first of all, we need to, to do proof of principle and separate fibroblast and myoblast. I'll run two gels, I'll identify new genes. Of course, these days that's what everybody is doing, whether it's proteomic or, or uh, RNA work. But way back, I was told that it is a bit of a fishing expedition. And uh, I thought, well, I like to fish. And um, one day I had all the, a lot of data from uh, the embryonic chicken and what to do next. And in a lab meeting, I remember Lee Quinn said, you know, nobody ever published isolation of adult myoblast. Why won't you try your techniques for adult myoblast? I didn't even know the name satellite cells then. I went to the library. I found the old book uh, from the first meeting. I think the book was edited by Alex Morrow. And I have read and I've decided that that's what I'm going to do. And here came the 1987 paper, which was, as far as I know, the first ever paper. Sorry, I'm so full of myself. Isolation and clonal analysis of satellite cells from chick chicken pectoralis muscle. And that actually opened for me the whole future, uh, including um, at that time it was called R29. It was uh, a grant from the NIH for first, uh, for junior uh, submitters. And we started looking with this approach at uh, satellite cells, at myoblasts from different ages, concluded by all sorts of more biochemical approach uh, that um, satellite cells actually emerge in late development. And indeed, uh, that was confirmed later with other approaches. And then came the day that I had the guts to write a grant application to the Muscular Dystrophy Association. At that time, um, Richard Bischoff already published his single fiber work where he looked with 3 ta timidine at uh, proliferation of satellite cells on FDB fibers from the RET, and uh, FGF was working. And here came my grant, was very well received. 
and almost a year into the grant and nothing works for me. We developed the method to isolate single fibers uh, to, together with Tony Rivera that was uh, a technician in my lab and I owe him a great deal of my career. He was a, a very dedicated and fantastic uh, co-pilot. And the BRD, we were about to label with BRDU and it just didn't work. Of course, two years later, everything worked well, but at that time, BRDU just didn't label. So we went back to treat it at the time it did. And those of you who did um, those kind of labeling, you have to then pour uh, a, a emulsion on the plate and wait three weeks and see the development. And it's a nightmare. There is no way you can do any experiment this way. So I was really uh, desperate. I thought, well, the muscular dystrophy will take the grant away from me because it doesn't work. And I needed to look, to have marker for proliferation to study effect of growth factors. That was as close as you can be in the transition from primary cell culture to in vivo. So in the library, I found about PCNA, I found an antibody. I uh, bought that antibody and it worked very well. Uh, I went to a meeting and I met a nice Italian person and we talked a little bit, uh, Alema, uh, his last name was Alema. And he said, you know, I have a myod antibody. I haven't published yet. You don't need to, to include me. I'll give you the antibody. Try to see if it also worked because we had a discussion that will be the way to go. So finally, um, and myogenin, Woody Wright had it still in his lab. It wasn't yet available uh, anywhere. And developmental myosin came from another uh, French guy. And uh, you had to do really a lot of networking then to get anywhere, but uh, it worked well. And here came the 1994 paper that for me was really uh, resolving a challenge and moving forward. And, uh, Peter Zamit especially, I, I, I like him very much because he acknowledged this paper quite often. So he's the one who raised my understanding that it's an important paper. Temporal expression of regulatory and structural, I don't see what is there. I need to move the muscle proteins during myogenesis of satellite cells on isolated adult red fibers. And for me personally, that was a good time, you know, um, a, a period that I really appreciated what I was doing and I was very alone. Uh, nobody was doing this work yet. So it was even interesting to be alone. Maybe Richard Bishop with some phone calls. Uh, just a minute, how do I do the, ne the next slide? It suddenly doesn't work. Um, don't tell me something happened here. Um, can you remind me what, do, okay, here we are. Um, so after introducing uh, uh, all the basic players of way back, uh, it was really the beginning of immunostaining uh, and having reagents for myOD and myogenin and so on. Pac-7 was introduced in, in 2000 by Seal et al, Rudniki Lab. And that's opened a major door for all of us at a very fast moving level, all the way from satellite cell detection to proliferation and self renewal and to genetic approach to satellite cell ablation. And you have heard about all this today by wonderful colleagues about their work. Uh, just to make a long story short for uh, if you look at the lower left, this is how we looked at satellite cells way back. This was the class, this is my picture from 95, but that's how Moro, Alex Moro introduced the satellite cell in 1961. And here, uh, the PAC-7, this is a paper we published in 2004, uh, how easy it became to see uh, satellite cells in cross sections. And especially in the chicken, it was really easy because you didn't need to do any antigen retrieval, it worked gorgeously. And from there, moving forward, there are a whole bunch of papers that we did with single fibers, and uh, later with the nesting GFP that uh, Kenny talked about. Um, 
And, and finally came the conventional myogenesis model that we can draw in many ways, and we are all familiar with it. Activated cells, PAC7 become IOD plus, uh, then they differentiate, uh, down-regulate PAC7, up-regulate myogen, infuse into myotubes, tubes, and then there are the reserve cells. Again, we heard about it from Kenny, and we heard from other talks today. Why did I call it conventional myogenesis? This takes me back to a publication with uh, Peter Zamit and Terry Partridge that came out in 2006, the skeletal muscle satellite cell, the stem cell that came in from the cold. I would like to remind you that there was a, peer, a number of years that the satellite cells were put on the shelf. Suddenly, we don't care about them. They are not important. Uh, hemangioblasts, pericytes, um, CD45 cells, all of them uh, uh, acquired a lot of uh, presence in the literature, a lot of publications. Uh, and, then we, and then it was clear that they cannot do what the satellite cells are doing. So this, this paper from 2006, in a way, um, you know, it was a, I think it was a very good time to work with uh, Peter and Terry as well, but that paper was really putting back the sense and the focus on, uh, it was a review on the satellite cells. So fast forwarding to 2021, methods change, questions remain. And I think even today, some of you even went back to classical biology from long ago, such as the work of Gabriel, uh, but with new methods that were never possible before. So that's the beauty uh, of, of moving forward, but going backward. What questions are remain that we don't know the answer? Now we have better tools, what can we do? So I would like in the rest of my talk to go through a few things that I have worked on and, and they certainly are far from being done and there is a lot of room and you smart people with your new methods Maybe you like to pick up some of that. So first of all, the pericytes. You know, there was a long period here in myogenesis that uh, um, there were studies, and there are still possibly studies on pericytes being able to be delivered um, intra uh, through the circulation and can uh, produce alternative to satellite cells and can help muscle. Now, how did I personally get into pericytes? Early on, when I developed the methods to isolate chicken satellite cells, we also made monoclonal antibodies to chicken satellite cells, except for one paragraph in one review, I haven't published it, was tremendous amount of work. And one of the antibodies especially was very attractive. It worked both with satellite cells and with pericytes. And today I know actually that it was nesting, not nesting GFP, just nesting, but way back, it was 200 kilo Dalton. It was cytoskeletal and I couldn't figure out what it was. And without much biochemistry, it became so descriptive. It's still waiting to be published one day. But I became very attracted to the pericytes and to smooth muscle, even without the idea that they might help skeletal muscle. And here is a, a, a reporter mouse that I highly recommend for those of you interested in pericytes uh, to go and take it. It's a Jackson, it's frozen now. We worked with it a lot. And you can see in the lower left, the diaphragm picture that you can very easily mistake a pericyte for, um, for a satellite cell, but, but it's not. It's actually sitting on the, ves on the uh, vessel wall uh, and especially in the upper right with the endothelium being highlighted with SCA1 GFP, you can see, um, you see it on the capillaries. Obviously there might be an interplay between satellite cells and pericytes. They are all in the same place, but uh, pericytes are pericytes and satellite cells are satellite cells. And we further uh, try to do intra-arterial engraftment of pericytes and satellite cells, and that's work that was not published. It was done by Pascal, who focused on the pericytes, and Nicholas Benkenstone, who focused on satellite cells. Uh, with pericytes, we have never gotten any evidence that uh, it, it created muscle cells, and we use mostly for donor cells the ML3, 3F, and LAXI. 
And with satellite cells, I don't know what to tell you. I think that uh, Nicholas tried maybe 13 different injections, but one time, one time, and that's the only time I'm showing you here, we did find a myofiber. Uh, the host was MDX mice. We did find a myofiber that showed uh, a, a LAGZI from the ML33F and LAGZI donor. And today, the, and on the very right, uh, I show just the control of uh, uh, intramuscular injection of the same population. So is that one case telling us that there are still some stem cells that can really be delivered through the circulation? Because what was this? And it wasn't just delivered, it, it reached the contralateral limb because uh, Nicholas used to, to use both the TA in both limbs for his analysis. So some hopes, lots of hypes. I don't think that pericytes make muscle and Pascal has another experiment that wait to be published one day. He did uh, fantastic experiments with uh, gel, uh, matri gel, uh, um, what do we call them? Islands, subcutonets islands, he injected it under the skin and uh, there was a penetration from the host of, uh, of SCA1 GFP of uh, capillaries into those agar pl uh, matrigel plugs. And the pericytes settled in and generated pericytes along, the, along those capillaries, as well as uh, a lot of macro uh, adipocytes. So hence pericytes are the source for some, some of the source for fibroadipocytes but we have never gotten out of it any, any myogenesis. So the next thing that I never finished, and uh, again, maybe, maybe some labs are going to work on it, is the, definitely uh, Christoph in his talk to the alluded to the FGF and FGF6. FGF, FGF are in satellite cells, uh, in satellite cell biology, I personally, and then with colleagues, have worked on this topic for many years. Had a lot of funding and have not reached a conclusion. So uh, as you can see in the upper panel with qPCR, and that's the work of uh, Pascal and Mike Phelps, um, that uh, in both limit diaphragm, we can see that there is out of the four FGF receptors, there is FGFR1 and FGFR4 expressed at high level. Whereas the non-myogenic cells, we call them FAPs, they are sorted with the SCA1, based on SCA1 antigen, only FGFR1 is expressed. So, and over the years also, here we are at the bottom, it's a newer mouse that uh, I believe that uh, Christoph has it now, FGFR4 lags in knocking. The satellite cells uh, are very well labeled and only the satellite cells. And this, these pictures look exactly like Mi5 lagz like pictures, exactly the same. You wouldn't know the difference. And, um, and that's not nuclear though, that's cytoplasmic. So uh, my personal hypothesis was for a very long time that FGFR1 is a generic receptor for proliferation and FGFR4 has a different job and maybe we don't even know where to look and how to look. And we did overexpression and underexpression. And to, I still don't know what FGFR4 is doing because uh, in uh, isolated fiber from conditional knockout FGFR1 uh, under the myo decree um, direction, so it was myogenic specific, we couldn't get any proliferation on single fibers of satellite cells. So FGFR4 was not rescuing uh, the, the ablation of FGFR1, but uh, in vivo, the very same mice after injury were doing regeneration very well. Maybe after a few days there was a delay, but at one month there was no problem. So the in vivo experiments are probably masked with other players that can help regeneration. Anyway, um, still the FGFR4 took me, uh, receptor took me to another direction. Uh, this was some years ago. Um, somebody told me there is a null mouse. It was at the NIH. It was a total null with a new insertion. 
and there was also FGFR3 null, and there was, uh, if you breed it correctly, you end up with double, with mice lacking both FGFR3 and FGFR4. And the small mouse in the picture is the double null, whereas the left mouse is wild type or FGFR null, they didn't look in that. And, and there was, you have to work really hard, certain laboratories saw a defect in FGFR for null if they give a different diet, but, but it was really impossible to, to make any conclusion that there is a defect in FGFR for null mice. The same goes now with the FGFR4 and LAG-Z, which if, if it's a homozygous, it's actually a null. A, a null. But the FGFR4 R3 double null was very small, we did a lot of studies on it. And here I'm showing you a cross-section of a 30-day-old mouse, the TA muscle. And, and the first thing that I saw, which I didn't know at the time at all, and now I point out here with the yellow arrow, is the spindles, the muscle spindles. So uh, the muscle spindles, and I, I will get to it more in the next section, ha slide, how is it connected to PAC-7 and PAC-3? The muscle spindles have a whole history and, and also in them the satellite cells were discovered in 1961, uh, exactly at the same time that Moro discovered them. There was another person, his name is just, he was from England and the paper is, uh, can be found on, uh, not in PubMed, but in, on the internet. And um, those uh, spindles are really fascinating. Uh, uh, they are in order for us to sense where are we in space. Like if I lift my arm, uh, it's perioreceptors. They tell my brain that I lifted my arm. So it's more about where, where the muscle is in space. It's not about contraction and, and, and force development and things like that. But what Marsha Untel published uh, years ago that the development of, of spindles, which con contain muscle fibers, and very early on postnatally, whereas the regular fibers continue to grow. So what we saw here, I still don't know if there were more muscle spindles uh, in, the, in the double null FGFR3, FGFR4, or simply they were more obvious because the regular fibers, what is called extrafusal fibers, didn't really grow. So they were very tiny and we have numbers and statistics about the fibers, which just will be published one day, but the spindles from that point on, I was very attracted to these structures. Um, so moving forward, um, some years later, my colleague Ben Roser from Canada called me up and said, you know, I have several graduate students and uh, uh, they are master students. I need projects that will be short enough for them to finish, but interesting enough and not too costly because my grants are very limited. And I said, you know, how about you look at the spindles? You have ch chicken of various ages. Um, ALD has a lot of spindles per the literature. Just try to look at what, what's going on there with PAC-7 and PAC-3. And I don't know if you can see it well enough at your end. Uh, this, is, this is one spindle here in the center with uh, uh, lots of small fibers. Uh, it's stained with myosin, just like the larger fibers that are what we call normal fibers or extrafusal fibers. And uh, laminin is surrounding each of the fibers. And if you go down to the middle figure, this is immunostaining with PAC-7, uh, DAPI to see the nuclei, and the laminin is highlighted now with a false color, um, also with um, some sorts of a purple. And you can see in the center, PAC-7 uh, positive um, and those are all nuclei. Uh, ben is, and his group looked uh, what might be within fibers rather than on, on the surface of the fiber. They spend a lot of time on morphometry. And if we go to the lower panel, we can see PAC-3. And uh, only two out of all the PAC-7 in this picture in the middle are PAC-3 positive. And definitely they were all detected in the spindle myofibers and not in the 
regular fibers, although the satellite cells picture show, the Pax7 shows both satellite cells in regular fibers and in the spindle myofiber. And what Ben did at that time with his team, they counted um, satellite cell frequency, satellite cells that were uh, uh, Pax3 positive, how many were actually not satellite cells but myonuclei, and, and you can see that there is a, a, quite a decline uh, during postnatal development, but uh, even at, uh, the, at uh, the middle figure is about Pax, percent of satellite cells that were Pax3 positive, and that's everything, including extra fusel fibers and spindle fibers, and you can see that there is a significant amount of Pax3 positive cells, even at 145 days, there was still about 17%. So this takes us back to a uh, quite a big question in myogenesis that I think um, is poorly resolved. What is the role of Pax3? There have been some recent uh, studies about Pax3 being actually expressed in satellite cells that are more under stress, uh, all sorts of things. Um, who knows? I think that there is a room there for a lot of work for those of you who are interested in the in Pax3 versus Pax7. And Kenny alluded to it, the diaphragm has a very high level of Pax3 expression. We could never get the antibody to work on the diaphragm. Uh, he showed the control, that work was done by Andrew Scherer, another former lab member, where we could get the very same antibody to work on on Pax3 in other tissues, even in the EOM where satellite cells don't express Pax3, there are non-myogenic cells that express Pax3 and the antibody work very, very well on them. Using identical approaches for the muscle, for diaphragm, if it's a mouse muscle, we could never get the antibody to work the Pax3. If it's a chicken muscle, it's very easy. Uh, since I started my career in satellite cells with chicken, I can only tell you, if you want good life, go back to the chicken, because, because especially you will not have the reporters, you will not have the, the GFP and Rosa, but if you want to ask basic questions about Pax3 and Pax7, the antibodies there are, are working very well. So the last, uh, I think, question, that I have left not complete. And, and that's, I don't know, I can see people that like colors getting into it, is the satellite cells in the EOM. And that was tremendous amount of work started with Andrew Scherer and then Pascal took on. We spent a lot of time on it. And that's why I was trying to reach Pascal for the last two years to, write the, to finalize the paper. But what we have noticed if you look at the left side, you can see a wild type mouse with a, a myo, myosin heavy chain 11, which is supposed to be smooth muscle myosin. Myosin heavy chain 11, Cree driven GFP. So we cross here myosin heavy chain 11 Cree with the ROSA 26 and TMG. And in adult EOM, these are um, the four there are six extraocular muscles, but four of them are very obvious in cross-section, and the center is the uh, optical nerve, and then around it is the RB, which is another muscle uh, for another day, but uh, basically in all, from, from chicken and, and frogs to the adult, uh, it's about the same, to mammalian, it's about the same structure. But we have noticed, though, is that the foundation of the extraocular muscle is ROSA26 is Rosa 26 MT. However, in early postnatal, just the first few days, we start seeing green belt building up at the periphery of the extraocular muscle. And this exactly corresponds with the, um, with one of the two layers of the extraocular muscles. And further work revealed that it's satellite cells that are green, and they create this uh, external layer. And we did tremendous amount of work to characterize the satellite cells, um, to look at them. And finally, we have noticed that when we crossed all of this into the MDX for CV mice, the pattern 
of this green external belt is left, is lost. And, and there is GFP all over the place. And we have done this also with another reporter with Lagzi. And the idea, since the EOM are so well protected uh, in, uh, in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and definitely in MDX mice, is it possible that those cells, uh, which is, I call them a secondary lineage in the development of the extraocular muscle, are actually able to rescue uh, the EOM muscles in, uh, in uh, the MDX mice? Those are questions that remain to be done. I actually had a, a small R21 to work on it, but I was really naive and the reviewers are, were not naive. It was not enough money to do the work that I proposed to do. So it's all back to money, as they say. Uh, unfortunately, science and money go, go hand in hand. So to conclude, how does one feel when being told you have never actually worked so that's my young son told me some years ago, and I thought he's starting with some liberal approach that I did all my research on tax money and, and tax paying money. I didn't know what he was meaning. And he said, you actually never worked. Your passion, your hobby, and your work were all one, one, one of the same. You, you really never worked, okay. So I looked, yes, I thought about it yesterday that yeah, I worked. But all of us here today, we share one thing, we love what we are doing. So Mary Poppins has a song and in every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. Find the fun and snap, the job's a game. And actually, in other words, when we set an hypothesis for grant proposals, or for a talk, we actually have first to fall in love with the idea. In my opinion, the hypothesis always comes second. Uh, talking about hypothesis-driven science, if we did only hypothesis-driven science, most of the research presented today will not be happening, I think. So I'm finishing with thank you for joining us today. And uh, I try to do it way shorter than 45 minutes to leave room for uh, questions and discussion of the entire session that we had today. And I like to thank Hugo and if he is tired, he can go home and sleep, but if he like to stay, he's welcome. And thank you very much Zipara for the wonderful afternoon and uh, the previous day because you influenced a lot all the conference.